Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series, we're in lesson number two now, is on, entitled In the Crucible with Christ. And this lesson for July 9 of 2022 is entitled The Crucibles That Come. The Crucibles That Come. Hmm. Let's begin with a word of prayer as usual. Our wonderful Father, we have come now to study together to think more about your will and your guidance. And we wonder how often that guidance can lead us into what might appear to be very difficult times. People have been injured, people have been killed, and people in our world even today are being killed because of their beliefs in you. We read about that fairly often in certain sources. But Lord, now help us to understand why these crucibles are necessary. May that become clearer and clearer as we study today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So continuing in our study in the crucible with Christ, we see this in the Bible study guide. Jim? A crucible is defined in the dictionary as a vessel used for melting a substance that requires a high degree of heat. Also, a severe test or a place of, or situation in which concentrated forces interact to cause <coughs> or influence change <coughs> or development. These definitions also give us a helpful insight into what happens in our spiritual lives. This week, we'll highlight some reasons we may suddenly find ourselves under pressure and experiencing tests in places in which circumstances cause us to change development and grow in character. This will help us to give, excuse me, this will help to give us an awareness of God, of what God is doing in our lives so that when we enter a crucible, we will have an idea of how to respond. From the Bible study guide for July 2nd. Okay, so now the question, the first question we need to really deal with now is, is it always obvious when you go into a crucible? No. No. Is it hot? <laughs> <laughs> it gets hot, yeah, okay. Does the devil want us to know when he's trying to put us into a crucible? No. He doesn't want us to know. No, he doesn't want us to know. That's absolutely true. Sneaks it in there and... So... Are, are sometimes these things, are they things that God brings us and sometimes they're things that we climb into ourselves? Well, that's one of the issues we have to talk about. We've suggested that there are three possible ways that we can do this. One, the, the obvious way is the devil could get us into trouble if, if, if he could possibly could. Probably even more often than that, we get ourselves into problems. And then there are times when it happens because we live in a, in a, in a bad world. So doesn't, this, doesn't God put us through a refined fire? Refining fire? Yes, that's that. what we're talking about. That's one of the things we'll talk Does about. Revelation. Huh? Doesn't it say that in Revelation? Yes. Yeah. Refiner's fire. Yeah. yeah. Well... <clears throat> How, how comfortable are Christians living in the Western world these days? As you drive up and down the streets of Loma Linda and maybe even to Los Angeles, does it look like people are really suffering? Generally, no. <laughs> generally, no. Okay, generally, no. How many of them are suffering persecution? Do we know of any people around us that are suffering persecution? Now, you can, we read about, we read about wars going on right now. Think of what's happening to the poor people in Ukraine. Um, <clears throat> places like that. But, and there's people, I, we don't time to, have time to go into all the details, but I can tell you, there are people intentionally trying to spread Christianity in some parts of the so-called Muslim world and they are taking their lives in their hands every time they do that. It's, uh, and, they, and, and people are being killed, I can tell you. I remember being persecuted in second grade. I see. I had a, had a 
guy that didn't like me, and um, I was I still can remember it. Oh yeah. So. That's her imprinted. Yeah. Yeah. Well. But well, I think some of the we talk about wars and we talk about these major conflicts, but some of these things I've been going to PT and I look at some of the people mm. in therapy whether it be occupational or physical therapy, and you just kind of go, they're fighting their own battles mm -hmm. with whether it was self-induced yeah, or the devil. Yeah. And some I know some stories about people who have come into physical therapy <clears throat> and just able, hardly able to move and come after years, really, of physical therapy and doing all their stuff like this, and they walk out almost normal. And man, that is a major, major victory. Really, it is. Well, while we do know there are areas in the world where Christians are being persecuted and killed, things are quite comfortable in, the West, in most of the Western world. Of course, there are events taking place that surprise us and which are unfortunate. There are auto accidents, there are losses including financial and health losses, and even betrayals by someone we trusted. How should Christians prepare themselves for whatever comes? Carrie? I'm reading from 1 Peter 4, verse 12. My dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful test you are suffering as though something unusual were happening to you. It's from American Bible Society, Holy Bible, Good News Translation. Uh, okay, so what are these? And different translations have the NIV and the NRSV have fiery ordeals, and the New King James Version has fiery trials, and my Good News Bible calls them painful tests. What are those things? Why do we centered on them also. It seems like the Bible centers on them and, mm -hmm. and Jesus says, count the cost before you follow me mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Um, maybe it's just to prepare you to be psyched up for what's, what could come. What's coming. And, yeah. um, I, I have often posed this question to classes. What, what, how many, when, when Jesus chose his disciples, there were a crowd gathering around. They wanted to be chosen. Choose, big, choose me, choose me, choose me. And Jesus spent the entire night before he chose those disciples, I'm sure, reviewing with his father, okay, this one, what's the pros and cons? This one, what's the pros? I mean, I, I don't know how they went about that process because God obviously would know oh, these are the ones, but... The next morning when he chose them, how many of them had even the faintest idea that he was choosing them to end up as martyrs? Yeah. I mean, what if he had said, oh, by the way, I know you think you're going to be a part of the new kingdom and you're going to be prime ministers and whatever they were called in those days, but uh, I have good news for you. Someday you're going to be martyrs. Huh? <laughs> I just... That's you know. too much for their paradigm right then. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, so what, I'm sorry, so what are these, uh, think about the times in which the early apostles lived. It became a crime punishable by death to be a Christian. Yet they went about convincing people that being a Christian was the right thing to do and converting them. I'd like to help you, okay? Let me tell you, uh, this is what I can do for you. You need to understand this and this, and you need to be a Christian. Oh, by the way, uh, be careful, because if people know you're a Christian, they're going to kill you. Wow. Christians were crucified. Christians were beheaded. Christians were burned at the stake in that first century. And <laughs> there's an incredible story told about one of the early Christian leaders that... Uh, they wanted, they got all the stuff ready and they were going to throw him to the lions. But the lions had already eaten so many people that had been thrown in that day, they said, <laughs> you throw them to the lions, they won't bother, they're, they're, they're stuffed already. <laughs> so they had to go out at the end of the day, pick up wood and so forth so they could burn him to death. 
So he, he went from being eaten by the lions to being burnt, cru uh, being crucified, not crucified, being burned to death. You know, I, you wonder, though, if maybe they were drawn by the truth mm -hmm. and it was so beautiful and maybe they didn't care about that anymore. So, well, it would certainly be, and I thought about what kinds of things would attract them. I mean, I'm sure that if we started talking about the miracles that Jesus did, even raising people from the dead, people would sit up and take notice. I mean, how could you not? You know? Well, even Jesus rising again just yeah. does something to you. I was with this guy, and what he said, you know, is going to happen, because look what happened to him. Yep. And so maybe you're not as scared... I don't know. <laughs> it uh, well, still seems like an emotional thing. The fact that he could raise people from the dead, number one, and the fact that he rose himself after being killed. You know that, well, what that tells us is dying is not the end of the story. Mm -hmm. That's a really important point. Dying is not the end of the story. Was it the text goes, the, the, the flesh counts for nothing? Yeah. It's the the spirit is yeah. is life, yeah. and uh, and so, the spirit is is what you've learned and, and uh, commitment that you make. So what did Peter say about all this? He said, "Be glad that you are sharing Christ's suffering." First Peter four thirteen. Of course, Peter was talking about the second coming. We wish that could hurry up now. Many things will be suddenly changed when that event happens. Have you ever wondered, as Job did, why evil people seem to grow and prosper while Christians struggle? Gary? Many of us are surprised about suffering because we often have an oversimplified view of the Christian life. We know there are two sides, God, who is good, and Satan, who is bad, but often we then automatically put everything that feels good in the box with God and everything that feels bad in the box of Satan. But life is not so simple. We cannot use our feelings to decide what is God's box or Satan's box. Sometimes walking with God can be challenging and hard. And following Satan can appear to bring great rewards. Job, who is righteous, yet suffering, illustrates this when he asks God, why do, you, why do the wicked live on, growing old and increasing in power? Job 21.7 NIV Okay, and that's from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sunday. Yeah. But not all trials come just because we are Christians. The greatest and most serious trials come because of Satan. First Peter Ira? 5, 8. Be alert. Be on the watch. Your enemy, the devil, roams like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. How can we prepare ourselves for the devil's attacks? We cannot see him, but we know that he is a very successful temper, tempter. For those of us who had experience seeing lions attack, and I lived for 17 years in East Africa, I have, I have seen this, and eat a, eat a victim, it is very gruesome. Satan's very existence is described like that. Should it be? I was recently down in the Everglades in Florida, and we saw a hawk catch, or actually a small eagle, catch a fish and hold him up there on the, on the, on the on a branch of a tree. And, you know, he's just ripping him apart. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty, well. Do lions attack in the night, too? Usually um, in the late evening or into the night, yeah. Yeah. Mm. For those, I'm sorry, 1 Peter 5, 8 through 11 talks about Satan's attacks, but also assure us that God, who calls us to unite ourselves with him, will protect us. How does he do that? So now, we first of all talk about the challenge, and then we talk about a possible solution. 
reading again, starting with 1 Peter 5, 8, and then through 11. Be alert, be on the watch. Your enemy, the devil, roams round like a lion looking for someone to devour. Be firm in your faith and resist him because you know that your fellow believers in all the world are going through the same kind of sufferings. But after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who calls you to share his eternal glory in union with Christ will himself perfect you and give you firmness, strength, and a sure foundation. To him be the power forever. Amen. Good News Bible. Okay, so there's some ideas. That's it, what gets that person all the way through PT. Yes. <laughs> it is always best to think of our lives in the context of the larger, great controversy battle between Satan and God, starting with the war of ideas which began in heaven until the final destruction of evil at the third coming. If we remember that we have that huge, broad, enormous span of time from the beginning of evil in heaven to the end, till evil is, evil is finally done away with at the, after the, or at the third coming, then it's a little easier to understand some of the things happened in, in the middle of that. Viewed in that context, we know that God has already won. We still need to remember that. He has already won the battle. We know what the final result is going to be. And he's waiting for us to join his side. Does God tell us specifically what we need to do to prepare ourselves? Well, there's no question about the fact that our world is full of sin. We are surrounded by it, whether we want to be or not, unless we live in isolation somewhere. After his initial greetings in Romans 1, Paul talked about the normal condition of the Romans and other pagans that lived around him. It was awful. And he did not waste time in saying that God's wrath will be poured out against all such people. What does that mean? Notice specifically that the main sin he mentioned concerning those who, who his main sin was concerning those whose, quote, evil ways prevent the truth from being known. Hmm. Whose evil ways prevent the truth from being known. How do we get involved in that? Are we ever responsible for, pe from, for preventing the truth from being known? Romans 1 goes on to describe God's wrath in very specific terms. Romans 1, 24, 26, and 28 tell us that God hands over or delivers over or turns away from the people who commit the sins described in those verses. Romans 1 has one of the most extensive lists of sins in the entire Bible. Look at Romans 1, 24 through 32. And so God has given those people over to do the filthy things their hearts desire. And they do shameful things with each other. They exchange the truth about God for a lie. They worship and serve God and serve what God has created instead of the Creator himself, who is to be praised forever. Amen. So what's the first sin, the first problem? Substitution. Okay, yeah. Worship the creature, worshiping the creature instead of the creator. That's a substitution, isn't it? Because they do this, verse 26, God has given them over. There we saw it again. Remember back in verse 24? So God has given those people over. Now he says, God has given them over to shameful passions. Even the women pervert the natural use of their sex by unnatural acts. In the same way, men give up natural sexual relations with women and burn with passion for each other. Men do shameful things with each other, and as a result, they bring upon themselves the punishment they deserve for their wrongdoing. Verse 28, because those people refuse to keep in mind the true knowledge about God, again, back at the beginning we said, the evil was preventing the truth from being known. What do we see now? Because those people refuse to keep in mind the true knowledge about God. Is that part of the same thing? And he's given them over. Notice again, he's given them over to corrupted minds so that they do the things that they should not do. They are filled with, and here's our list of sins. The things, uh, the, all kinds of wickedness, evil, greed, vice. They are full of jealousy, murder, filing, fighting, deceit, and malice. They gossip, oh dear, 
Gossip is right in the middle of this list. And speak evil of one another. They are hateful to God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They think of more ways to do evil. They disobey their parents. They have no conscience. They do not keep their promises, and they show no kindness or pity for others. They know that God's law says that people who live in this way deserve death. Yet not only do they continue to do these very things, but they even approve others who do them. Good News Bible. Whew. How do you like that list of sins? Yeah. We need to remember that God's wrath is simply his turning away in loving disappointment from those who do not want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. So God, when he's, he demonstrates his wrath or his anger, he's doing what? Is he attacking people? No, he's stepping back and allowing them to reap the consequences of their own choices. So what should God do with sinners who repeatedly refuse to respond to his wooing? Finally, he must let them go and hand them over to their own decisions and their own devices. What about God's health laws? Our bodies are supposed to be the temples of God. Do we treat them like that? How many people in our world are destroying themselves by practicing evil habits? There are times when God needs to deal with his people in order to produce the purification necessary before he can take them to heaven. Jim? Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 7. Because of this, the Lord Almighty says, I will refine my people like metal and put them to the test. My people have done evil. What else can I do with them? Notice, what Bible. else can I do with them? Yeah, good news, Bible. He's done everything he can. And yeah. it, it, all that we were explaining or reading earlier there in Romans, God's, it just, is, his love is permitting you to do what you have you have made a decision to yeah, and, and if you think about those, that list of sins, what would happen if he took people who were doing all those things to heaven? The great controversy would just continue. It would be like a hell for them. Yeah. Well, not only for them, probably for everybody else well, too. But ultimately, if, if sin, which we've defined in the past, I've heard you say, is, is separation, mm -hmm. what can live separated from the source of life? Yeah. Sin separates. Psalms 59, verse 2. I mean, I'm sorry, Isaiah 59, verse 2. Um, sin separates us from God. It's not. God doesn't do it. need to do a lot of action. It just lets sin run its course, and okay. death will happen. I always wondered about that. Um, how would God raise a child? Because a child would not necessarily... He, he doesn't just leave him, leave the child to do what he wants. He's going to go and stop him, maybe, maybe shake him a little bit or yeah. whatever. So it's it's kind of a, there is a that, discipline about God. That's maturity, too. Yeah. And, that, yeah. and that's one of the crucibles we're talking about. Mm -hmm. God, doesn't, God doesn't just automatically leave. He only, he only does that when you are persistent and going away from him, going away from him, going away from him. But finally, God says, well, if you're absolutely determined to go away from me, then... What can I do? But, but that's the adult. Yeah. My, my question is the yeah. younger one. No. And, and when are we, when are we an adult really, being only 85 years old before we die, where angels are, could be millions and billions of years old. So when is it that God would act like you would to just, just let him go, do whatever he wants, you know, type of thing. Where's the point? He never does that until he sees that they're determined to leave him. Ultimately, God then honors your choice. Yeah. But you've already probably... As an adult. He, as an adult. Well, see, and wait, how does God train? Doesn't he use finite beings in time and space to communicate and educate the finite beings in time and space? Yeah. So there's, there's a... There's a... There's not a... a well, the uh, we talk about the angels. They've had 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 influence over over humans. Uh, you've, you've got Psalms eighty-two as an example. 
uh, read the whole passage. It's only about six or seven verses long. But uh, it says, you're gods, but you're going to die like men. You yeah. know, or it's, uh, verse two of that. You have not educated, you have not judged properly uh, the, well, the people. And unfortunately, the war began in heaven. Yeah. And a third of the angels ended up leaving. And didn't God do a perfect job as, cut, yeah. as could be? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Carrie, if the Spirit of God... Oh, yes, I can see it up the top there. If the Spirit of God brings to your mind a word of the Lord that hurts you, you can be sure that there is something in you that he wants to hurt to the point of its death. <laughs> That's from Oswald Chambers, my utmost for his highest. Uh, as famous. In the adult Sabbath school Bible study. Very famous, long, uh, long ago Christian book that many people have read. Okay. God requires perfection of his children. His law is a transcript of his own character and it is the standard of all character. This infinite standard is presented to all that there may be no mistake in regard to the kind of people whom God will have to compose his kingdom. So that's the issue, you see. God, I mean, God loves everybody. We're all his children. He would do whatever he could to save every one of us, except he's not gonna, he's not gonna have a, uh, come uh, a prison in heaven with everybody in their in their you know cells. separate cells so they can't hurt each other or, or, or you know do some damage to each other. God's not going to do that. There's going to be perfect and complete freedom in heaven. So God can only admit to heaven people who are safe to have there. Can you imagine how how would would God the universe run in for, in a, in an in an in ideal way? Uh -huh. Uh, if you, we know that laws don't work, mm -hmm. I mean just enforced. Yeah, you, you, you can, it's, it's, but if if because if you have laws and you got to have judges, you have courts and and uh, prisons and policemen and all these they, they, people keeping score. If nobody is self-centered, mm -hmm. you don't need any of that. If everybody is loving and everybody does what is right because it is right. You don't need any. You don't need any of those things. That's right. And yeah. that's the only way that I can see. Yeah. Maybe I'd like to get some other input, but uh, I can't see. How, no, let's let's run. just live in a place. And like let that. this mind be in you, as is in Christ Jesus. Yeah. And, and, uh, but I think learn to think to like Jesus. To present that to the immature Christian in a way that I mean, I look at God requires perfection of His children. I'm never going to be perfect in this world. Well, it's an offer remember, rather than remember a command. That. Remember, Maxwell used to say, yes. uh, 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 yes. "Be perfect." Or, but it also in Luke it says, "Be ye merciful as your Father is in heaven." Yeah. Or a Father. The word perfection there in the Greek is teleos, which means mature. Mature. Well, yeah. but to the immature yeah. Christian, they see perfection. Mm -hmm. They don't know that that word means mature, and it's, I think we just need to remember that part when we're yeah. describing that to others. Education is a process. Mm -hmm. Jesus came as a teacher, as the way I understand it, and not as a penalty payer. Yeah. Because nobody really learns anything of, of much value if somebody pays your penalties. Yeah. Okay, Carrie, we've interrupted you. You want to start there with the life of Christ? The life of Christ on earth was a perfect expression of God's law. And when those who claim to be children of God become Christ-like in character, they will be obedient to God's commandments. Then the Lord can trust them to be of the number who shall compose the family of heaven. Clothed in the glorious apparel of Christ's righteousness, they have a place at the king's feast. They have a right to join the blood-washed throng. That's from Ellen G. White, Christ Object Lessons, page 351, paragraph 1. And you know that in certain Christian settings and environments, that's complete heresy. The, some of us remember a time when someone came here as a visiting guest from far away and said 
when I get to heaven, I'm going to show the God my right to be there. Uh -huh. And the idea that you could be, you would go to heaven because it's safe to trust you to be there. Oh, no, no, no. I'm here because I have a right. It was a, he had his title deed to heaven. Yeah. Remember, the, 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 that was a phrase, I think, that he used. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, God has a very specific reason for testing and purifying his children. He wants to take as many of them as possible home to live with him forever. Notice the explanation God gave to Jeremiah about why he was doing that. Gary? Jeremiah 9, 13 through 14. The Lord answered, This has happened because my people have abandoned the teachings that I gave them. They have not obeyed me or done what I told them. Instead, they have been stubborn and have worshipped the idols of Baal as their ancestors, to, ancestors taught them to do. Good News Bible. Okay, can you remember a time when God revealed to you the necessity of eliminating some sin from your life? Oh boy. Was that comfortable? Yeah, you're meddling. <laughs> yeah, you got there are three reasons why that process may be uncomfortable. First, we experience pain as God allows circumstances to bring our sin to our attention. That could be painful. A little earlier, Jeremiah unhappily writes, The bellows blow fiercely to burn away the lead with fire. But the refining goes on in vain. The wicked are not purged, are not purged out, Jeremiah 6, 29. Thus, sometimes drastic action is needed in order to get our attention. The standing up on the desk and yelling yeah. fire. Second, we experience anguish as we feel sorrow for the sin that we now see clearly. Third, we experience frustration as we try to live differently. It can be quite uncomfortable and difficult to keep choosing to give up such, give up the things that have been so much a part of us. That a yeah, from my school Bible study guide for Wednesday, July six. What would you say are the common sins of Seventh Day Adventists in 2022? Do we dare to ask that question? Mm -hmm. How can we turn away from those sins? What might God need to do to help us eliminate those sins from our lives? Paul had what he called a thorn in the flesh. Do we know what that was? He begged God to take it away from him on three occasions. But God finally essentially said, no, don't mention that to me any, any that, don't mention that anymore to me. That, th that thorn is there to help you develop character. Hmm. Can any of us have a thorn in the flesh in our day? An interesting illustration that might help us to understand that is as follows. Gordon? There is a big difference between cutting down and pruning. <clears throat> we cut down plants that we don't want anymore. We prune plants that we want to develop into greater fruitfulness. I think my wife does this, but I don't. I see. Both processes, however, do involve a sharp knife. Indeed, pruning requires cutting parts off the plant that might seem to a novice gardener like destroying it. In a spiritual context, Bruce Wilkinson writes, are you praying for God's superabundant blessing and pleading that he will make you more like his son? If your answer is yes, <laughs> then you are asking for the shears. <laughs> oh boy. As from Sisters of the Vine. No, Secrets. Secrets of the Vine. People have wondered what Paul actually meant by a, quote, thorn in my flesh, end quote, from 2 uh, Corinthians 12, 7. Ideas range from Paul being under constant attacks from enemies to having a speech difficulty it seems that this was actually a problem with his eyesight. That has all been from the Bible study guide for Thursday. Paul had a bodily affliction. His eyesight was bad. He thought that by owner's prayer, the difficulty might be removed. But the Lord had his own purpose, and he said to Paul, speak to me no more of this matter. My grace is sufficient. 
it will enable you to bear the infirmity. That's from a letter 207, 1899, Ray Allen White, written from Australia and quoted in a few places. Is it possible that God might afflict us, as he did Paul, with some disability or disadvantage in order to get us to walk a closer, a closer walk with him? Paul told us that this thorn was to prevent him from being con conceited. Do you think Paul was ever tempted to feel conceited in his days as a Pharisee? How about later? <laughs> was he tempted later also? How do you suppose a problem with eyesight could keep one from becoming conceited? 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10, the verse that was mentioned up earlier. But to keep me from being puffed up with pride because of the many wonderful things I saw, is that talking about the time when he, he talks about he went to heaven and saw things? I was given a painful physical ailment which acts as Satan's messenger to beat me and keep me from being proud. Three times I prayed to the Lord about this and asked him to take it away. But his answer was, my grace is all you need, my, for my power is greatest when you're weak. I am most happy then to be proud of my weaknesses in order to feel the protection of Christ's power over me. I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. God has given us three main tasks in which he expects each Christian to be involved. One, Bible study. Two, prayer. And three, witnessing to others. How well are we doing at each of these essential Christian tasks? Do any of those three involve suffering? Notice these words from Ellen White. Jim? He who reads the hearts of men knows their characters better than any, excuse me, than they themselves know them. He sees that some have powers and success susceptibilities <laughs> which rightly directed might be used in the advancement of his work. In his providence he brings these persons into different positions and varied circumstances that they may discover in their character the defects which have been concealed from their own knowledge. He gives them opportunity to correct those, these defects and to fit themselves for his service. Often he permits the fires of affliction to assail them that they may be purified. Ellen White, Ministry of Healing, page 471, paragraph 1. Okay. He permits the fires of affliction to assail them that they may be purified. That's a good one. I like what's, that one. What's, what are the fires of affliction? All well, kinds th of this is part of the crucible, right? Mm -hmm. The fires of affliction. The Lord brings his children over the same ground again and again, increasing the pressure until, perfectly, per, until perfect humility fills the mind and the character is transformed. Then they are victorious over self and in harmony with Christ and the Spirit of heaven. That would be a state of atonement, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. The perfection of God's people cannot be accomplished without suffering. He passes us from one fire to another, testing our true worth. True grace is the willing to be tried. If we are loath to be searched by the Lord, our condition is one of peril. Ellen White, My Life Today, page 92, paragraph one, uh, paragraph two. Wow. Okay. Now, is this something that only God does or he permits it? Is the devil somehow involved? Oh. oh. <laughs> It may seem very difficult to live a Christian life, following all of God's guidance for our lives in our troubled world today. In Romans 5, 1 through 11, Paul talked about what God had done for him and can do for us. He concludes by these words, writing Romans 5, 10 and 11. Carrie? We were God's enemies, but he made us his friends through the death of his son. Now that we are God's friends, how much more will we be saved by Christ's life? But that is not all. We rejoice because of what God has done through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has now made us God's friends. And that's from the Good News Bible. Okay, if we had the whole night here, we could discuss the question of how does Christ's death make us God's friends? 
and it's not just by paying a penalty for us. Do we clearly understand how the death of Christ makes us God friends? And what is it about Christ's life that saves us? Is another huge question. Education. If God is our Father and if He is loving, kind, gracious, and generous, then why does He need to keep bringing us back to talk about our sins and our deficiencies? And would, would, wouldn't it be nicer if He could just forget about those sins and deficiencies? <laughs> In this week's lesson, we talk about different types of crucibles. One, some come from Satan. Two, some come from our own sinfulness. And three, some are brought on by God to help purify us and form our characters for his kingdom. Should we, should we be looking forward to the trials that we know are coming? Eventually, sin and even will, evil will be completely eliminated. When is that going to happen? Third coming. At the third end of the third coming. God must do that in order to recreate our world as it was in the days of the Garden of Eden and make a name, I'm sorry, make a home in which his children can dwell. So what do we need to do to be ready for that experience? Many things. <laughs> it will be very helpful to be aware of the great controversy and all that it involves so that we know to expect the enemy. It also means that through Bible study and prayer, we should get to know God better and better every day. And finally, it is helpful to have spiritual friends with whom to sit to discuss topics in the Bible and with whom to study the Bible in depth. Question. Why is that? Hmm? Said uh, up above, our world as it was in the days of the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. So in the Garden of Eden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil was there. The devil was there. Mm-hmm. We're not going to have that in the future. Thank goodness. Yeah. Thank goodness. So it's better than the Garden of Eden. And Yeah, it will be. And what are the advantages of sitting down with friends as we're doing here and discussing these issues? Discussing. Refining. Challenging. Challenging, yes. It's awful easy, you know, Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 9, the human heart is deceitful and more deceitful than everything else. We can lead ourselves into rosy paths so easy. And we need to be comfortable with meeting with friends and say, oh, I guess that wasn't such a good idea after all. I was just looking that up, Jeremiah 9, 17. Yeah. Who, heart of a man is evil continuously. Who can know it? Yeah. Shouldn't there, there is be major activities in our lives? What percentage of our time do we devote to these activities? Bible study, prayer, witnessing. Do we take seriously the idea that Christ, by his life and his death, has answered the questions and accusations of Satan in the great controversy? Do we understand those questions and those accusations? Do we understand why his death and his resurrection have defeated the devil? Do we know how we can join Christ's side, the victorious side? Does, did God win the great controversy just because he's more powerful? And finally, he's going to destroy the devil? It's more than that. It's a war of ideas. It's not a war of power. Okay. And what does that tell us? It's, it's God isn't going to control minds. He's going to, not going to force people. He says, here's the evidence. It's laid out before you. Study it carefully. Make up your mind. And you can decide whose side you want to be on. And 1 Peter 5, 1, Paul assured his audience that he himself Peter. had been... What? Peter, I'm sorry. Peter assured his audience that he himself had been a witness of Christ's sufferings. No one could say that he did not know what Christ had been through. If we believe that Christ is supposed to be our example, should we be surprised if we are tempted and suffer? In his challenging book of First Peter, Peter talked about many of the aspects of suffering and how they might affect the life of a Christian. But Peter reminded us that we should not be suffering because of something wrong that we have done, but rather because we have done right. And how often does that happen? And certainly we could never claim that Jesus suffered because of something wrong that he had done. 
There was nothing about the life or death of Jesus, our righteous example, dying for us, that was fair or righteous or just. Now, not, not talking about the things that he did, but the things that were done to him, okay? But those very acts, his life and his death, are our example and will be the example for the entire universe for the rest of eternity. When we have the opportunity to review what happened to Jesus, especially in that final week of his life and in Gethsemane, on Calvary and rising from the tomb, we should never have any excuse for complaining. In fact, Peter told us, 1 Peter 3, 14-17, But even if you should suffer for doing what is right, how happy are you? Do not be afraid of anyone and do not worry, but have reverence for Christ in your hearts and honor him as Lord. Be ready at all times to answer anyone who asks you to explain the hope you have in you, but do it with gentleness and respect. Keep your cons conscience clear so that when you are insulted, those who speak evil of you, your good conduct as followers of Christ will be ashamed of what they say. For it is better to suffer for doing good if this should be God's will than for doing evil. Good News Bible. So hopefully Christians will never be persecuted for doing evil. That's not what we're supposed to be doing, right? We know unequivocally that a time of trial and trouble is coming. In fact, if the Christian church or even the Seventh-day Adventist church members had lived more faithful lives, Jesus would have come back before now. But surely every faithful Christian, no matter how much he suffers or even if he should die because of his faith, will one day look up in the clouds and see Christ coming and be glad. Notice these assurances from Peter, recorded in 1 Peter 4, 13 through 19. Rather be glad that you are sharing Christ's sufferings so that you may be full of joy when his glory is revealed. Happy are you if you are insulted because you are Christ's followers. This means that the glorious spirit, the spirit of God, is resting on you. If any of you suffer, it must not be because you are a murderer or a thief or a criminal or a meddler in other people's affairs. However, if you suffer because you are a Christian, don't be ashamed of it, be, but thank God that you bear Christ's name. How, how many of us think that we're suffering because we're being a Christian and it's really because of what we've, some way we've offended someone or mm -hmm. acted wrongly toward them? Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. So true. The time has come for judgment to begin, and God's own people are the first to be judged. If it starts with us, how will it end with those who do not believe the good news from God? As the scripture says, it is difficult for good people, good people to be saved. What then will become of the godless sinners? So then, those who suffer because it's it is God's will for them, should by their own good actions trust themselves completely to their Creator, who always keeps His promise. Good News Bible. We have spoken in this lesson about the devil. His activity is described in some detail in 1 Peter 8, I'm sorry, 5, 8 to 11 that Gordon read to us earlier. But many people in our world, even many among Christians, do not believe that there is a literal, personal devil. The following is from the Bible Study Guide, Teacher's Edition. The figure of the devil was real for Christians throughout history. The Protestant reformers viewed his existence as real. However, during and after the Enlightenment, philosophers and theologians 
built a worldview that rejected the existence of persons or phenomena that operated beyond the known world. This worldview conditioned liberal Christianity today to deny the existence of the devil as a real person. And Ken, you've told us stories yeah. about, I went uh, to, and I've heard preachers say that there isn't a devil. Yeah, I, I, I taught a Bible class to a group of people who asked me, come, come to our house and we'll invite our friends over and let's, let's go through the Bible. And I was explaining about, uh, just really getting through Genesis and talking about the devil and the role of the devil and so forth like this and Revelation and so forth. And a theologian who had come to visit our class was invited to join us from another church. So all of a sudden just busted out and said, I don't know why we're discussing this. We know perfectly well that the devil doesn't exist. Yeah. Anybody that's been involved with that kind of thing will tell you straight out it's very definite that he is there or his pals. Yeah. Well, if the devil isn't there, how do you know that God is there? Yeah. I mean, well, there's and a lot of things that could be beyond, you know, just yeah. just this. What, so that's God's spirit, you know. It's, that's what this paragraph is saying. Those philosophers said, well, if there's something out there that you can't see and we can't prove it in any way, it probably doesn't exist. I think among Jews, there, there's not a lot of belief in, in the devil either. Yeah. yeah. Continuing in the uh, Teacher's Bible Study Guide. Instead, this group, that is the ones who deny the existence of the devil as a real person, this group declares that the devil is merely a mythical representation of the principle of evil. Consequently, evil is now regarded as the result of ignorance or as a product of a long, violent evolutionary process from which the human race emerged. Thus, they say, evil is the result of a material, genetic and social determinism. Even if some Christians would admit the existence of the devil, they would find it difficult to believe he is indeed as wicked and powerful as depicted in the Bible. <clears throat> as Bible-believing Christians, however, we regard the existence of the devil as real. For Jesus, Satan was a real being, not a symbol of some inner dark aspects of his mind. And see, for, exist, uh, for instance, Matthew 4, 1 through 11. And that's, of course, talking about the temptations in the wilderness. Yeah. Paul, too, saw the Christian as engaged in a fight that is waged against, quote, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, end quote, Ephesians 6, 12. And here in our lesson, Peter reminds us to be on our guard against the attacks of the devil, 1 Peter 5, 8. However, though he is real, the Christian does not focus on the devil. Why don't we focus on the devil? By beholding, we become changed. By focusing on the devil, we become like the devil. Mm -hmm. Yes, we must be aware of his existence and careful not to fall for his deceptions. But the center, the essence, and the joy of our life in, is Christ and his salvation all from the Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 28. Certainly the devil was real when he tempted Christ, as recorded in Matthew 4, 1 to 11, as we mentioned a little bit earlier. He was very real when he led his forces of evil to accomplish the crucifixion of Jesus on Calvary. Ellen White assured us that the trials we face and the struggles we go through are an essential part of the training that God has for us. And the life and, of, and quoting now from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 60, and the life of toil and care, which was henceforth to be man's lot, this is after Adam and Eve were cast out of the uh, Garden of Eden, was appointed in love. It was a discipline rendered needful by his sin to place a check upon the indulgence of appetite and passion, to develop habits of self-control, it was part of God's great plan of man's recovery from the ruin and degradation of sin. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 60, verse 1. We are all aware that there is a lot of evil going on in, in our world. People are dying, people are being killed because of their beliefs, but sometimes we are still surprised when difficulties affect us. Should we be? Or should we remember the words of Peter and the words of Paul and be prepared for what is coming. 
So, now, what have we learned in this lesson about crucibles? They come from three places. What are the three places? From the devil. From the devil. From ourselves. From ourselves because of our own sins. Previous sins and what that's leading us into because of bad habits and? From God himself. Okay. Is it possible to tell when we're tempted and when we feel like we're in one of these crucibles where it comes from? Not necessarily. In fact, not probably necess not. Not necessarily. Often it's not. But um, Peter and Paul both have given us some hints about how to know whether it comes from God. And James just says, if something like that happens, it can't be from God. It has to I mean God doesn't tempt people. And that's a word that we need to mention, and we'll talk more about that in future lessons. There's a difference between tempting people and testing people. We expect our teachers in class to test people, but we hope they won't tempt people. Um, what's the difference? Well, it's the same word in Greek, because they had a, a more limited vocabulary than we do. So we, we, we say that God doesn't tempt people, but he does test people. I mean, what's the, if we say God puts people in crucible, what is that? That's testing. It's test. Yeah, the, 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 I don't see you, you can describe that in any other way other than, other than the testing. So, we live in this evil environment. You drive down the road, you can't avoid seeing evil in this part of the world everywhere you go. So how are we supposed to avoid being affected by all that evil? We're, we're swimming around in it. Yeah. What? Keep our eyes on Jesus. By beholding, that, we become changed. We by beholding, we become changed. Heart. How much of our time, how much of our effort do we put into focusing on what we should be focusing on, focusing on the life of Christ, focusing on his death and why he died to keep us protected from all the evil that's around us? Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to come together with friends and study your word and try to figure out in, in, in better detail how these things impact us on a day-by-day -day basis. Help us to come closer to you and become more like you as we study these lessons is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.